start recording. Hello, uh, I'm Richard Ladner. I'm the principal investigator for Access CS for All. And we are presenting our first in a series of four webinars. Uh, we call them Accessible Computer Science Teacher to Teacher. And this one is Blind and Visually Impaired Students. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll announce the three more that are coming up. But I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our, our presenter today, Gina Fugate from the University, excuse me, from, I wanna say University of Maryland, but it's Mar Maryland uh, School for the Deaf. Um, I've really gotten to know her well over the last couple of weeks as, as we've been preparing for this, um, for this presentation or this webinar. Richard, School for the Blind. School for the Blind, oh my <laughs> God. I, it's been a long week. I know, it's been a long week. This is like the fifth meeting today for me. Um, School for the Blind. So we're doing deaf and hard of hearing next week or in a, in, yeah, in a month or two weeks. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna uh, share my screen and, and Gina's gonna, help me through and tell me when to advance. So just take a second. Okay. Oopsie Daisy, let me go back. So hello everyone. Um, like Richard said, I'm Gina and I'm based at the Maryland School for the Blind. Um, I welcome you here and I hope this um, helps you understand how to make things more accessible, not just for blind and visually impaired students, but maybe even for others as well. Um, next slide, Richard. Um, so a little background about me. Um, I like to point out that my um, bachelor's is in English education and I never really even imagined myself um, teaching initially at a school for the blind, um, more or less teaching robotics to students um, who are blind. So it's really been a journey and I'm happy to share that journey with you. But I also emphasize that because not everybody has that computer science background. Computer science is a shortage area. Um, so is being a teacher of the visually impaired. So um, it is all possible and I hope that we help make that seem more possible and, and doable for everyone across the board tonight. Um, I do have a master's of education in visual disabilities. Um, that's from Vanderbilt University and that includes the braille codes. Um, so that's literary, what you would think of for typical reading of text. And then MIMIP code is what is used for mathematics. I also have an assistive technology certificate it's actually pretty old as far as assistive technology goes. So I'm currently updating my assistive technology certificate um, through the University of Massachusetts. Overall, I have 15 years of teaching experience. One year is Project PAVE um, that happened while I was at Vanderbilt that really got me immersed in the field in several ways. I've also served as an itinerant teacher. Um, so TVI stands for Teacher of the Visually Impaired. COMS stands for Certified Orientation Mobility Specials, and AT is Assistive Technology. Um, so an itinerant teacher travels school to school, um, often in a designated county, but it could be a designated territory. Um, so that's working across all age groups and working with general ed teachers, typically in a collaborative manner. Um, it could involve providing some pullout instruction to a student for braille or assistive technology. Um, I'm really glad that I have that itinerant experience. And then eventually my Vanderbilt sister, Sarah Borley, led me to my journey here at the School for the Blind. Um, so I left Kentucky and I came to Maryland. This is my sixth year at Maryland School for the Blind. Um, so that provides a little bit of my story but I thought it was really important to provide a photo of what we do with STEM at the Maryland School for the Blind. So the other photo um, 
on this slide shows part of the dot five u dots which is our school-based first lego league team and we're going to play a video that kind of sums up why i'm here and what i do with my students okay. can you see the video yes i have to turn the sound off Can't seem to turn the sound on for some reason. Yeah, we seem to have lost that. Maybe you could say what's going on. That might actually be easier. So you're seeing students um, working on a first Lego league table. So it has a mat, um, it has Lego models and the students are working with a Lego EV3 robot. They're running the quorum programming language and then it's also showing some shots of what happens um, in the classroom and some of the different strategies that we use. So there was some um, flashcards that were laminated. It also had braille labeling on it. Um, this is colleague Ford. He has since graduated, but he was talking about the challenges of accessibility, but as well as the importance of having these experiences. Um, First Lego League, something that is really unique about it is a lot of people assume that we're competing against other schools for the blind. First Lego League is actually open to everyone. So we are competing against the sighted peers in the public schools. Um, this is actually showing a tactile graphic. That's a Lego EV3 brick. Uh, that's one of our students talking about his vision and that he can't see what's on the screen of that brick. Um, that is showing a <laughs> giant tactile graphic um, that Lego had sent us in collaboration. The still shots when we have uh, the crowds around us, that was during a tournament. This is back to Paul Leek. Um, and this would also be a good time to point out that we're, we're releasing the PowerPoint for tonight, the Google slide. Um, so it will have the link to this coverage if you'd like to see it. Um, and with the sound, there had been a shot of a student at a laptop. They were using Form Studio for programming, which is accessible. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. That's back to the student on the laptop. and then feeling the parts of a Lego motor. Another one of my students who is um, always one of the most excited about coding and comes to every coding opportunity that we've offered, including on the weekends. This is a robot that had to launch from that launch area, go to a designated location and then come back to um, home base. So that was all in preparation for first Lego week. Shall I go back to the slides then? Yes, I was just going to say, I think you could exit out of this. Let me just kill this. I have no idea why it. Okay. There you go. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things I like to talk about is what do blind or visually impaired people look like? Um, in my own journey, it seems like everyone always talks about Helen Keller. Um, that is the number one go-to example that um, I was given when I first started to experience visual impairments. Um, and by all means, I have deep respect for Helen Keller, but there are a lot of other examples out there. Um, and let's not forget about Andy Sullivan, who was visually impaired herself. Um, Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles, again, they're great examples, but they're not necessarily the most, um, the only examples that I would like people to think about. So what does a blind or visually impaired person look like? Let's consider that for a moment. Next slide, please. Do you want me to talk about these people? Because I know them. Yes, Richard's going to help yeah. us out on this. He knows uh, he knows a lot of them very well, and I wanted to make sure we got the pronunciations correct. And I know you know some too. Um, yeah, so these are our eight uh, blind people or people with low vision that I 
uh, that I know uh, who are all in computer science or in related fields. Um, Sherry Azincott is a professor at uh, Cornell Tech at the University of Washington, at, at the Cornell Tech in, in New York City. Um, she graduated from the University of Washington and she has low vision. Stephanie Ludi is a professor at North Texas State University. She also has low vision. Sean Meelan is a PhD student at um, North Carolina State University and he's totally blind. Ju Young so Seo is a, a PhD student at Penn State uh, University and he's completely blind. Sang Young Han is a, another former student of mine. I, I love that picture, by the way. He's doing, he's touching a tactile graphic, uh, which is a project we worked on together. And he's uh, he's um, an engineer at uh, at Facebook. Uh, Cindy Bennett uh, is totally blind. She was a, also a grad student I worked with at the University of Washington, and uh, she's now a postdoc. She had her, got her PhD last year, and she's a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, ben Kadesh Patluri is a, a current PhD student at the University of Washington. He's completely blind. And Sina Branham is a um, um, is a self-employed, I guess. He has his own consulting company, and I think he's a, like a multimillionaire. He does uh, incredible consulting in the accessibility area, and he's completely blind. He was a former PhD student also at North Carolina State University. So I feel like these four are kind of, uh, you know, I call them role models or whatever, but they're people that have really done well. All of them are programmers or developers uh, of one kind or another. So uh, this is what can happen to a blind student uh, at a lower level. Yep, thank you. Back to you, Gina. And I would just add that there, there are many other people, if you're interested in um, learning more about that, we can always give you some more resources, but we wanted to highlight especially some of the programmers. Um, so let's talk about what do blind people see. Um, you are considered legally blind if you have at least one of the two eye conditions when wearing the best corrective lenses. So first visual acuity is 2200 or worse in the better eye with corrective lenses. Um, and I'll emphasize with correction um, because that's something that people often say, I'm legally blind without my glasses. I'm like, well, it counts for your, your correction. The other aspect of it is the field of vision um, has to be re restricted to 20 degrees in diameter or less in the better eye. Um, so it's a combination of these two things that are um, that are considered for most um, definitions of being legally blind. This would apply to social security. This would be looked at um, for several standards related to, um, to how the person will be referred to in terms of their visual ability. Um, so right. that gives so, us- So Gina, just quickly, so blind does include people with low vision. The, Blind the does include people with low vision, um, and there is a spectrum which will kind of be clarifying this. It's one of the, probably the most confusing aspects to um, people who are, are learning about blindness and low vision, um, is to understand the, the spectrum of people. Yeah. Okay. And um, to give you some examples of impaired vision, there's actually an app um, called Vision Sim. It's by the Braille Institute. Um, it is only available on, on iOS, but it does give you an opportunity to simulate what it is like to have a visual impairment. So I just made some screenshots that um, show various visual conditions. Um, the first image makes things look super cloudy, um, almost like a really dense fog. The second one, everything is really just blurry, um, but it's much easier to discern color. Um, and the third one has like a black area in the center of the person's vision. So I would just invite you to think about what it would be like to experience um, that if that was your regular vision when you're 
um, traveling in a hallway, when you're looking for a doorway, uh, when you're attempting to access text, um, it's a good example of the variation that a person can experience and um, how complex the needs can be. Um, also a reminder that a simulation is just that, it's a simulation. Um, so uh, I use it as a tool to help a person empathize, but this doesn't necessarily equal somebody's um, exact circumstances by any means. Yeah. Next slide, Richard. Yeah, just before you go on, uh, if somebody is, if you call it totally blind, they still might be able to see some light, but they wouldn't be able to see the features uh, like in this hallway. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is another sort of simulation, but um, to give you something that would be a little more of a near, near task. So this is a first, a screenshot from um, a computer screen, and this is actually part of the quorum language um, website. So on the left is a clear image, and on the right is a blurred image. In this instance, the image on the right would not allow the person to access anything visually, reading with their eyes. So this would be an example of where a person might need a screen reader. Um, or perhaps getting closer to the screen might help them, but of course it would need different tools and resources in order to access the same information. Next slide. Okay. Um, and then just to give a couple other instances, people are always interested in, in how to um, imagine visual impairment. This uh, first photo in the top left shows two children, two boys, and they're each holding a a different ball. Um, one boy is holding a soccer ball with uh, that is also red and white. And then the other boy is holding uh, sort of like an orange just gold colored ball. Then there are five other photos, all with different visual simulations. So the second photo has sort of like black blobs here and there that um, block most of the faces of the boys. Um, as well as the balls, but little pieces can still be seen as well as the background, the fencing in the background, but it definitely distorts the, the image and you could think about how much you would have to move around if that was your vision to try to spot things um, functionally with your vision and what challenges you would encounter there. The other photo um, is mostly black and there's really what's often called like a pinhole of vision. This is a really good example of what they said visual um, in relation to visual field loss. So this is very common with retinitis pigmentosa. That's actually the eye condition that I have. Um, my vision is nothing like this. And again, there can always be a spectrum, but it's something to think about. Um, RP, as it is often called, is actually um, degenerative. So it could get to the point where my vision is like that, but in the meantime, you could be in a lot of different stages. Um, right now, it happens that most of my visual field issues are in the lower area um, of my left eye. The other photo here um, has sort of like a blurred gray blob that blocks the faces of the two boys. And then the rest of the image is a little bit blurry. Um, but you could discern some visual details there. Then there is another image that has the two boys and um, this image is just a little bit darker than the one with typical vision and just slightly blurry and compromised. So again, thinking about if you had that experience, how would that impact your reading or your um, eye fatigue throughout the day? And finally, the last image there is of the two boys and it presents um, the beginnings of what I would describe as uh, double, vi double vision or sort of mirrored images. It looks like it's even presenting almost three things, almost like a reflective shadow coming, coming off of the two boys. Um, so again, the impaired vision, just think about crowded hallways, 
what it would be like to travel in a dimly lit area, um, changes in lighting, traveling on the stairs, um, the difference between familiar and unfamiliar areas, and navigating around wet floor signs or construction um, is one of my favorite things to make sure I'm on the lookout for. Next slide, please, Richard. So a little bit about demographics. Um, there are 27,000 BVI students, so blind or visually impaired students, under the IDEA. So the IDEA is um, a special education law that requires us to, to provide um, educational access to students that are blind or visually impaired. So that comes down to one in 2,000 students um, across the United States. There are probably more under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, but that's a good example of where it becomes really hard to track all of the different students and all the different circumstances and how they're served. About 90% are in mainstream schools with some clusters in bigger metro areas. Um, it is not unusual for there to be just one blind or visually impaired student in a particular school. Um, I can say that when I was an itinerant teacher for a large school district, this definitely proved to be true to the point that our district eventually worked to allow those students to meet other students through community gatherings. Um, but again, imagine going through this and not having any role models that you could relate to or any immediate peers um, that could uh, empathize with you on a personal level because of their own visual impairment or experience. Next slide, Richard. So continuing a little bit about demographics and supports, um, those students are often supported by itinerant TBIs. So TBI, just as a reminder, stands for Teacher of the Visually Impaired. Those students are often pulled out of regular classrooms or support services. So that would be different for each student. Um, of course, catered by their individual education plan. Um, it could mean that a student is pulled out by the teacher of the visually impaired in order to receive Braille instruction. Hopefully they have some collaborative in instruction between the teacher of the visually impaired and the English teacher. Um, maybe it's a mixture of sometimes they're in the integrated classroom and sometimes they're receiving um, pull out or a student who is visually impaired. Um, it could be a similar scenario. They might receive pull out services for technology to learn how to use a computer and different accessibility features but they might also receive collaborative support within their um, regular integrated classroom. The image at the um, bottom of the slide is a very col colorful image of the United States. And it is just highlighting that schools and agencies for the blind are located in each state. Um, and in the resources that we provide at the end of this presentation, there's a link that breaks down those resources state by state. So we mentioned um, sort of a spectrum of vision and that's what this slide is um, relaying. There is a horizontal arrow and on the left end is blind and on the far right is sighted. Um, a little bit to the right is low vision and we actually could have even added the term visually impaired between low vision and sighted. So it's just another way to illustrate the variations that um, students may be experiencing. With blindness, there is high variation in accessibility needs. So they could need what's called speech output. Um, an example of speech output would be what's called a screen reader. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, magnification is something that I definitely use on a daily basis. There's specialty software to do that. Um, there's also accessibility features within most um, of the technology devices we use on a daily basis for magnification as well. 
Um, Braille is also definitely an important support for um, students who are blind. And you might have students who are in the process of learning Braille um, because of the instability of their um, eye condition or eye fatigue. Tactile graphics, Richard had mentioned when he was highlighting one of um, his former students. Tactile graphics are raised images. Um, it could be made out of raised lines or braille um, that represent a visual image. It just allows it to be felt with the fingers. Um, also a question I often get is, do students have additional disabilities? And the answer to that is they might, but they might not. An example is that students could have autism. They could be hard of hearing. There might be learning disabilities. There could be um, cerebral palsy. Um, they could have dyslexia. So I like to say that it's, it's really just like anyone else. There could be other conditions or challenges present, um, but they also could have blindness only. Next slide, Richard. So how students are served, just to try to break this down again, um, students may be served in the public schools. We kind of talked about that with the teacher of the visually impaired. Students may be served at a school for the blind. So that's where I'm based at right now. And schools for the blind have multiple resources, of course. Um, students may attend a program that blends the public school and a school for the blind. Um, so that experience is um, more unique, but one of my favorites. So we've had students who have attended Maryland School for the Blind on a temporary basis. And then after they've received um, their technology instruction and maybe their Braille instruction, they're ready to go back to their, um, their home school and they return to the, the public school environment. Um, we've had other students who come and then decide to stay longer. Uh, that is reviewed on um, an annual basis or even an, an as needed basis. Um, students may attend the School for the Blind temporarily and then return to public school. So uh, an example of that would be, it's more of a short term scenario. Um, instead of staying at a School for the Blind for a year or two, depending upon the program and the resources, a student could attend a school for the blind for as little as like one quarter. It's very much catered to their needs and it can vary a lot um, state to state. Richard, please, thank you. So screen readers, um, they do exactly what it sounds like. They're reading what is on the screen. So we have a series of logos here um, and hyperlinks. So the first example has the Apple logo and it's hyperlinked to voiceover. Voiceover is um, something that will speak to you if you have um, an iPhone. You can also use it on a MacBook. It is one of the most popular screen readers with um, my students. And it is um, a built-in accessibility feature. Um, so there's no cost there. Um, Talkback is part of Android. So I have the green robot logo there. It's really the exact same concept as VoiceOver. It's just Android's version. Um, there is the JAWS logo. JAWS stands for Job Access with Speech. JAWS is one of the most popular screen readers. Um, it does require an annual subscription. It is also one of the most long-standing um, screen readers around. Um, and my students would want me to emphasize that recently they added Sharpie, which is sort of a um, digital assistant that you can ask some questions to. Uh, the next logo is orange and it has sort of like a cartoon image of a face with some sound waves and it is representing Chromevox for Chromebooks. Again, this is an accessibility feature that is built into Chromebooks. 
micro books have been especially popular during the, the pandemic. Um, they are one of the easiest, I guess, pieces of technology to access the Google suite, of course. Um, they have a lot of different accessibility features. So when a student is using Chromevox, it would read everything to them on the screen. Uh, NV Access has a logo that is um, shown. It's almost like a starburst, and it has a circle. And then there's a square inside the circle, and then there's a smaller circle inside that square. Um, it's NV Access's logo says empowering lives through non-visual access to technology. Uh, it's actually developed by two gentlemen who are, are blind and NVDA is a free screen reader. Um, so you could go to NV Access and download that and experience the screen reader um, for yourself. It is open source. Um, so it's constantly um, being updated, but it also relies on donations to uh, maintain itself. Next Gina, slide. Gina yeah. I just want to interrupt you for a second. And for, for the audience, uh, you'll notice that Gina is describing all the images on these slides. And, and, and that would be so typical of a, a teacher of blind and visually impaired because <laughs> the kids can't see these pictures. Um, and also there might be somebody in the audience today that can't see these pictures. So um, it's kind of amazing to, to, to hear you do this uh, audio description and make sure that everything is accessible. And if you had a blind student in your class, you might want to change your behavior a little bit more as well so that you can include that student. I'll yeah. go to the next slide. Now. Thank you for pointing that out, Richard. I, I do it almost without thinking about it. I know. <laughs> that exact same reason. Um, so magnification is um, visually seeing what is on the screen. There is a um, screen clip that is um, showing the menu of um, something that is called Zoom text. So it actually is highlighting a lot of different features here. The zoom level is the magnification level is on two. Um, and then there are options for window, color, pointer, cursor, focus, navigation. Um, you can control the size of your zoom window um, and um, the way that things are navigated. It's really an incredible tool for um, persons who have low vision or are visually impaired. You can customize pretty much every aspect that you can think of. Um, so it, it really is a great resource. On the lower middle of the slide is um, something that's known as the Connect 12. It is an Android based device. Um, so it has apps in it. Think of um, basically an Android tablet. And then um, that screen is at an angle. It's on a mount and there is a gray rectangle below it. So you could put a worksheet or something on that gray area and actually magnify that um, worksheet or paper onto the screen and the user of that device could adjust the angle of that screen. There's also um, almost like a pole that is sticking up in the top right hand corner of the frame and on the top of that um, pole is a camera so that is so that the person can use the camera to basically zoom in to magnify um, distant information that would be on a whiteboard, a smart board, um, even posters and different things that are around the room or, or even people's faces. So it's um, definitely designed for someone who is visually impaired or low vision and it has a lot of capabilities. Um, Windows 10 magnifier has a screenshot there that has um, simulates basically a word processing area. So that could be um, Microsoft Word or Google Docs. And then there is a small window that allows the person to magnify. Um, you heard me reference, I've used magnification and Windows Magnifier is um, 
probably what I use more often than anything. I prefer to just magnify the entire screen. Um, but again, you can customize all these different things to fit your needs. Yeah. Next slide. Um, yeah, before you move on, one thing you didn't say was one of the things that I use a lot is uh, Control Plus on, on the web page. Um, yes, so yeah. That, that's an easy way to, you don't have to buy a product for that. Yes, um, you could do Control Plus or Control Minus if you're on a web page. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do the Windows magnifier, it's Windows Plus and Windows Minus. If you ever mix them up, you'll learn through usage right away how to get those straight. <laughs> Um, so this takes us on to Braille. Um, Braille has really come a long way over time. So in the top left-hand corner is a picture of um, one of the smaller Braille displays. This is available through the American Printing House for the Blind. And again, all of these things are featured in our list of resources at the end of this. Um, all of the Braille displays have a series of eight keys that the person would place their hands on. Um, you have six main keys for um, accessing the dots that are used to produce Braille. And then the rectangle strip that has, it, it'll look like maybe white metal pins um, based in this picture. That would actually be the area where metal pins would raise in order to provide what my students call instant Braille. The formal name for it is refreshable Braille. Um, but using these devices, um, the person who is using the Braille display would be able to access text that is in a Google Doc, um, Microsoft Word, or even navigating throughout their, their iPad or whatever device they're using. In the top center image is uh, what I would call old school Braille. So it's been printed, we would call it embossed here at the School for the Blind. And there is a person um, with their index finger on their right hand kind of extended and touching the line for the Braille. Um, so Braille is read with your fingers. You have to develop that tactile sensitivity. Um, and ideally they would be using um, more of their fingers, not just one finger. Um, in isolation. On the top right, believe it or not, this often surprises a lot of people, but the um, Braille writer is basically, a, a lot of people would think of it as like the, a Braille typewriter. So it has the, the core keys, those six keys that I referred to for producing Braille. Um, it has a space bar, it has a backspace. Um, this is a device where the student would roll in a piece of paper, much like you would with an old school typewriter, um, and they would produce Braille by pressing on those keys and then be able to take the Braille out of that device. On the bottom left is um, a black and blue device developed by Freedom Scientific. This is the Focus 40 Blue because it has 40 Braille cells. And the angle of this photo um, nicely shows some of that refreshable Braille or Insta Braille and somebody accessing that. Um, the bottom right is actually three pictures in one. It is um, demonstrating the Humanware, Humanware Braille Note Touch Plus. So it is the first Google certified device um, that incorporates a Braille display feature. The first part of it is just the cover that is enclosing the Braille Note Touch Plus. The second one is where the cover it has been opened and the physical Braille keyboard um, is there. So that's where the student would typically Type, access, um, type Braille by accessing those keys. And then the Braille display refresher Braille area is below there. What's really cool about this device is you can actually lift up that keyboard and then there's a Google um, page demonstrated on the Android tablet that is below that. So in a public school setting or wherever that person is at, 
they could be typing in Braille and then they could flip up that screen and you would be able to um, show a peer or a teacher the actual print that they were producing. So it's really a true, true dual media device and it has foreign language support and all sorts of things. It's an exciting development in our field and they've already expanded on it. Um, but we wanted to give you an example of, of how students can access Braille in different ways. Next slide. So even more about Braille and tactile graphics. Um, the top left hand picture is what's often called a PIOC machine. Um, PIOC stands for pictures in a flash. So it is a PIOC tactile image maker. They're using something that's called swell paper. You could draw on this paper. Um, you could also print an image on it from, let's say like PowerPoint and you feed it through this machine um, that heats the paper and it makes the um, black lines and images become raised. So it really makes sort of instant tactile graphics. The picture um, that shows a, a tactile graphic that has been made and it has um, the person using a, a better hand positioning for accessing the tactile image. They're using both hands and they're exploring um, a bar graph um, as well as tracking lines related to the bar graph and, and all the information that you would have in a typical graphic. Um, over on the right side is a product from the American Printing House for the Blind. This is an example of um, the way that a student might access information about um, the human skeleton. This has tactile labels that are large print as well as has, it has braille. There is a image of a skeleton with a list of all the different parts. Um, there are booklets that go with it, including print and braille. So there's support for the, the teacher as well as the student. And then there is a model that can be manipulated to also um, feel the different parts. So this is just an example of one of many, many kits that have been designed to help out students um, and that um, at least when I was an itinerant teacher, peers were often interested in things like this. So it could be integrated to help many students all at once and provide a hands-on experience. So now we finally, we're gonna talk about coding. <laughs> um, so why coding? Um, these quotes are directly from my students. Um, they will say it's cool. Um, it's normal, and normal is in all caps, though I promise I'm not yelling at you. Um, the kids would just say, you know, they're like any other kid. They want to be normal. Um, and I would add that one of my students would say that being blind is expensive. Um, everybody is coding is something else that one of my students will often say. Um, they will also say coding controls the world, and I can be part of that world. So in that instance, I would think about Alexa and Siri, they're surrounded by te technology and they understand what is behind that technology. Um, and then the latest thing that they've started to say to me, is this something I can get paid to do? Um, so they definitely are coming to realize that that is a possibility. Um, some of my students have met Sina and, um, it's just a great connection. There's no more powerful connection than, than giving a student a role model, just like we do with visual kids all the time. Um, I think the difference is that we have to, to be a little bit more purposeful with students that are, are blind or visually impaired to make sure that they make those modern day connections. Um, the items that are highlighted on this slide, again, are driven by my students. So, on the bottom left, there is an image of a, tech, of a digital tablet and there is a hand holding a wand. Um, this is one of the most popular products that 
was out a few years ago and my students knew all about it because they were Harry Potter fans and they wanted to um, handle the wand and they wanted everything to be accessible, but they were limited in what they could do without assistance because it was not accessible to them. Um, coding with Minecraft. Minecraft is popular um, across many age groups. Um, it's sort of like Lego. <laughs> it's, uh, it's being used by the elementary all the way up through um, adults and code.org um, also launched coding with Minecraft. But again, it's something that is extremely visual. So how would you access that or participate and that um, even if you were a person with low vision, um, and how would you interact or, or um, you know, work with someone if you were blind, um, but interested in Minecraft? On the bottom right, there is a unicorn robot, which of course has its own app um, with drag and drop blocks. Um, but again, the accessibility is, just not there for the students. At the same time, my students like unicorns and mermaids and all the things that any other students would like. Um, so this sort of sets the, um, the desire and reflects what my students are looking at. So, um, you know, yes. yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add a bit. So these are three examples of literally hundreds of sort of coding tools we call them sometimes uh, that are available for children uh, but i would say 99 percent are not accessible yes and this is an example of three and it it feels like there's countless examples there's always something coming out yeah next slide okay and so let's look at some resources to help make coding accessible to all and I really want to emphasize all of these things um, can help provide access for students who are blind or visually impaired, but they can be used with any student. Um, and that's what we really want to focus on is making an integrated experience. So code and go mouse um, and coding critters are um, a product that you can use that is obviously targeted towards elementary and younger kids. Um, the first age group that is emphasized is four plus on the boxes. But one of the cool things about um, this product is that it's very tactile. So the main character, the Code and Go mouse, has raised buttons. I could hand this to a student and they can orient where is the tip of that mouse's face uh, they can feel the raised buttons. Um, they can orient what direction um, is represented by that. And so with just a little bit of adaptation or maybe some additional tactile labels, um, this product is fairly accessible um, and can be used by um, a teacher of the visually impaired or a classroom teacher in an integrated setting. Um, the green blocks are, are all raised and fit together almost like a puzzle. If I was using this with a student who is blind, I would just add some braille labels or even um, some raised stickers for like the arrows that are on the small um, green squares that are used for coding. So an example of this is that there is a yellow straight arrow you could use even like a foam arrow to make that raise um, so that a student could understand what is represented there. Um, but there's a lot of potential with these products. Um, with a few adaptations, they could be what we would call mostly accessible to our students. Um, the next thing is Code Jumper, and this is one of the newer products. This has been sponsored by Microsoft. Um, we're not going to play this video, but there is a um, video that's highlighted in this slide and is also listed in the, the resources. What this product really does is it provides those hands-on pods is what they call it. 
so that the student can use the pods um, to really replace the block-based coding. Um, and then they can manipulate the dials and things on the pods in order to create um, different coding experiences. Um, this is one of the few resources that I know of that is available on Chromebook or Android devices. Um, and there are, there are a number of instructional supports for the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, and Microsoft will continually be working on this. So again, you could have a hands-on experience. Um, you could have students work in teams and you can have a lot of great experiences with this product. Next slide. So CoQuest is um, an app that was exclusively made by the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, it has an inclusive design for voiceover users. So remember, voiceover is an example of a um, screen reader that is available with, with iOS products. This was targeted at age four, and it also includes files for 3D printing. So an example of that is you can 3D print one of the aliens that goes along with the storyline in this app. There are also free files in order to emboss um, tactile grids um, that complement CodeQuest. So um, it's really a great resource. And again, it's something that could benefit multiple students. It was purposefully designed for students who are blind or visually impaired. It has the voiceover um, ability. It has the high contrast, but a lot of these things will complement the accessibility in, and needs for students across the board. Um, so it's really something that could be used in any classroom or with any group of students. Next slide. The Sphero Spark Plus and Code Snaps has been um, very popular with our students. This only works with the Sphero Spark Plus. Um, so that's roughly $100. It fluctuates a little bit um, depending upon where you're getting them. This app is free. And um, in the picture, there is a digital tablet. This is actually an iPad. And to the right of it, there's a series of um, cut out blocks that have QR codes as well as print um, and different details on these QR codes. Um, all of this is available for free. You can download it and cut them out. I think the hardest part of this is cutting out all of those blocks. They nicely fit together, but there are a lot of different pieces to cut out. So there's an image for blue and it has the color blue, it has the QR code blue, and it has a little blue paintbrush. That rectangle has to be cut out along with red and purple and green and yellow. Um, there's a rainbow coloring code command, but once you have all of these pieces, you basically have a tactile set of uh, what would be equivalent to the drag and drop blocks. Um, our kids loved taking all these pieces and putting them together. What you do after you have those together is you use that iPad to scan the blocks that you have put together. And then once you scan it, it will produce the visual um, block code on the iPad app. This still works with voiceover the entire time. Um, so it really is inclusive. It can be pretty challenging um, to scan those QR codes um, if a student is blind or low vision. But again, the motivation is there and the possibilities of inclusive instruction or um, interacting with a sibling or a friend is there. So that is what excites the students um, and makes them, you know, think, think back to the statements they mad, made about it's normal. This is giving them that coding experience. Um, I would also point out that in that bottom left corner, there was a um, what's called the Sphero Chariot that just fits right over the Sphero Ball. 
um, that's compatible with Lego. So you could have a Lego minifigure or other character um, parading around depending on, on the programming experience. Next advanced, slide. I advanced the slide too quickly. That's um, okay. Okay, there you go. Um, and then Blocks for All, um, again, a really cool app. Um, it was made by Lauren, is it Milne? Milne. Milne. Um, so it is a free app. Um, it works with voiceover. It works with the dot and dash robots from Wonder Workshop. Um, it is another example. You, you have all the different possibilities that you would have with any coding app. You have sound and variables, vehicle um, functions. You can break that down into animal sounds. Um, this program had the robot make a lion sound, and then it changed the um, color to blue for the lights, and then it made the robot snore. Um, so just a simple experience, um, but you can also add other variables and, and complexities. Um, so again, just kind of thinking about in an inclusive classroom, why not use this as an app and include everyone? Next slide. So we are going to um, attempt to play this video. Um, this is a young man named Boone, and um, he is using the app with the Dash robot that is pictured there. I wonder, Gina, why don't we just have people come back to this? Um, and sure. Why don't we continue on so we'll have, make sure we have time for questions. OK. OK. Um, so he's yeah, so really cute. So I hope everybody goes back to him at, at some point. But the Dash robot is what I would call a tripod. He's got um, three areas uh, that are basically shaped as spheres. And then his head on top is another ball. And it has a, um, an eyeball there that can focus on, on different people. And it's also voice activated. Yeah. Next slide. Um, Swift Playgrounds is something else that is extremely popular with students. Um, it works with voiceover. So um, Apple has produced this and um, definitely made sure that it was inclusive. There are also a number of resources um, to make Swift Playgrounds fully accessible. Um, if a student is using Swift Playgrounds on an iPad, for example, they can actually focus on the visual image that has the um, graphical character in the Swift Playground world, and it will describe the location of it. Um, to really simplify it, they're still using a grid area that you would think of um, that would be kind of similar to working in Excel or Google Sheets. Um, so you have coordinates to focus on. Um, and then you have a text-based experience where students would either type out the text or select the phrases in order to code. There are tactile graphics that could be produced with swell paper or um, embossed. And if you don't have access to those things, of course, they can also um, be purchased outright. Next slide. Lego EV3. Um, is what we use for first Lego League. So of course I had to highlight that. This is a standard Lego EV3 kit over on the left side. So there's a sorting tray with um, a lot of the connector pins and Technic pieces. There um, is a charging adapter. There are the sensors that are available for the Lego EV3 robot. Two of the motors, uh, large motors and a small motor the Lego EV3 brick that we had um, emphasized in that intro video, um, and a battery, just different parts of the kit. There's also an image of what we call the Lego EV3 puppy, complete with a Technic dog bone. And then there is an image on the bottom right that is um, a Lego EV3 kit that has been um, built into a color sorter. So there are Technic pieces um, that are red, yellow, green, and blue. And if they're put on the rotating belt there, 
the device could be programmed to actually sort things out by color. Next slide. So this starts to get into how we're able to make it a more accessible experience with Lego. Um, Quorum Studio is uh, made by Andrea Stefik, and it was designed with the blind and visually impaired in mind, but um, it was made for everyone. It is screen reader friendly. Uh, it is Zoom friendly. So Zoom would be a term for magnification. Um, what Richard had pointed out earlier with control plus and control minus, um, it has that capability with, within the um, Form Studio itself. There's significant support via the Google group listserv um, for Quorum and then also the Quorum team, of course. Um, you can put questions out on that Google group and numerous people will respond. Um, and I would even point out that Andrea Stefik himself will often respond and correspond with people. So um, it is also a unique experience, I think, to get that level of support. Um, I also wanted to point out that there's something called EPIC. So it is an annual conference. It's called the Experience Programming in Quorum. And that is um, how I met Stefik and came to realize that LEGO EV3 could be an accessible experience for our students. Um, something else that's really important to point out is that Quorum is an evidence-based programming language. So um, it's an understatement to say that Stefik did his, ho his homework and he studied um, what is happening in programming languages and he realized that there's not necessarily evidence-based reasoning behind the design of some of these languages. So he started to purposely create and examine that as he was developing Quorum. Um, there is a video here, I'm not sure. Richard, do we have time to show that? I think we'll move on. Okay. Okay. I think... Uh... Gina asked me to read this slide because this slide is showing a, one example of a program that simply outputs hi there. And if you wrote it in Java, which is the most popular language taught, well, it's near the top of the list of languages taught at the university. And it's also uh, AP computer science A's for, for high school students. And if I wanted to write a program to do that in Java, I'd have to say public class, hello, left bracket, public static void main, left paren string, uh, left uh, square bracket, right square bracket, uh, args, right paren, uh, uh, left um, curly brace, four, uh, and so on. So this is, I'm trying to read it like a screen reader would have to read it. <laughs> So you can see how arduous this would be. And even people who are cited make mistakes in this very simple program. I would probably. In the quorum language, which was evidence-based as mentioned by Gina, you would just say, and, and here we wanted, to, we wanted to say, hey there 10 times. We'd say, repeat 10 times output in quotes, hey there, and that's it. So which would you rather have read out loud? what's on the left or what's on the right. And if, if you go back um, later on and look at the, the video um, that we've referenced, Stefik does a really great job of reading or, or just saying out loud um, a coding line of Java with the spaces and everything, but he has that down to a routine um, pretty much equivalent to um, a screen reader. Um, yeah. So again, think of, the perspective of somebody who's visually impaired or somebody who's trying to access that line of code on a braille display. It's not impossible by any means, but listening to all of that um, punctuation and the bracket information is, is really intensive. Um, so thinking about what is more inclusive um, is definitely what has happened with Quorum. Next slide. I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a screenshot of Quorum Studio. 
So um, it also has a blue rectangle um, around the editor area. And that's because at the time of the screenshot, I had NVDA on. So um, there is a visual highlight that is possible with the screen reader to kind of show where it is at. Um, the Quorum Studio can be completely accessed with key commands. So just as an example, um, the project area would be accessed using control one. The editor window where you would write your code is control two. Um, and the output area is control three. What I would emphasize about this experience is that in other programming environments, students would not necessarily be able to access all of the information that a visual user would be able to access. Um, so Quorum Studio was born accessible is another one of the phrases and descriptions that's, that's used for Quorum Studio. Um, and it's about providing equal access and equal opportunity for coding. Next slide. So in both of these slides, actually, I um, just provided some sample code. This is Quorum Studio again with the, um, the same emphasis on, on the key commands. In this instance, I'll focus on the editor area has a sample of music code. Um, so this is a really basic code that one of the students had um, typed out when they were first exploring music code. Music code is known as MIDI. So musical instrument digital interface is what is taking place here. Um, this is prior to the student using the repeat and, and creating loops, but just exploring code um, within one class period and making a lot of progress. Next slide. This is simply a screenshot of a quorum programming um, language homepage. So this is what it would look like if you just went to quorumlanguage.com. Um, it has an area that emphasizes learn, the professional development area, um, social area, and then downloads. Um, there's also access to the AP computer science principles area. Um, all of the libraries are accessible here. So this is sort of coding home base for us. Next slide. Um, so I'm known for focusing on those Lego robots. So of course I wanted to show you what that looked like here. Um, this is an area where it's beginning to um, provide access to how to use um, Quorum with the Lego EV3 robots. So this was under the learn area. And then there is specifically a robot track that would provide all the information you need to get started um, with LEGO EV3 and Quorum. Next slide. Um, so my students know that the number one rule is go to the library, um, check out the sample code. Um, one of the treasures that I found almost unbelievable when I first started to get into Quorum was that there's all of the sample code in all of the libraries. So focusing on the Lego Robotics Library. Um, the section has battery, button, color sensor, gyro sensor, infrared sensor, motor, screen, sound, touch sensor, ultrasonic sensor, and utility. If you click on one of those components, it will take you into another screen. Um, next slide. And so with this one, I actually went to the motor um, library and then I, I did scroll down to the actions table just to show you um, that there is a sizable menu of actions available. And if um, any of those links are accessed, it will take you directly to sample code. Um, but there is a description for each of those links that tells you what it does. So if you can um, refer back to this presentation or go and explore the quorum page, it will lead you to code that you can actually use right away. Next slide. 
Um, so this kind of takes you back to my kids, as I often call them. This was um, the last photo of the Dot 5 U Dogs as we had wrapped up at a first Lego League tournament. So this was our um, the largest team that we've had since um, I've been on board with the Dot 5 U Dogs. This is our seventh and eighth graders. Um, and there are three of us as coaches there. Um, two out of three of us are um, visually impaired or legally blind. Um, and then I also have my um, faithful comrade, my other technology teacher um, who's in this photo. Um, over on the right, there are uh, four of my students celebrating when they were um, awarded a trophy. Um, I would emphasize that First Lego League is, is just a great experience to go and to do. It provides students with social opportunities. Our students um, are always intimidated and nervous. I don't know who's not on a First Lego League day, um, but they always love it. And these kids are attending a tournament on a, on a Saturday morning. So it's a very long day. And I would also say that out of this group, there are a couple students who sometimes are very shy and overwhelmed, even in, in my classroom, but they went to this first Lego League tournament and they competed in the robot game. They competed in the project and they competed in core values. They were presenting to strangers that they don't know and coaches are not allowed to help them during this area. So there's just so many opportunities for growth and development. Coding is part of it and a part of it that I love, um, but it brings out so many other opportunities for, for our students. Next slide. Um, so this shows the other First Lego League team, which is really a whole other story. <laughs> um, so this is 180 Optimum and uh, they got the Core Values Award um, and again, this was their last photo right before the pandemic hit. Um, the student in the center is actually role playing for the skit. So she's in a wheelchair and she's holding part of um, their project, which involved a Lego um, QR code. If you want to scan this QR code, you can learn more about what their project um, involved. So the project is another aspect of a first Lego league beyond the coding, but you definitely have an opportunity to learn more about them. The, um, the other thing that I would point out about, <laughs> about 180 Optimum is that most of the students in 180 Optimum attend public school. So um, there is some overlap between Dot 5 U Dogs and 180 Optimum because we found that some of our Dot five U dogs just can't get enough of this experience. So they ask or they volunteer to come to um, the, the 180 Optimum coding team. And again, that meets on Saturday mornings um, into the afternoon and is above and beyond their school time. We also had the gentleman um, who's the tallest in this group. He came to MSB after he had aged out of First Lego League. So um, he was technically too old to be part of robotics, but he didn't want to miss that experience. So we adopted him as a junior coach and he um, attended practices and learned along with the students and then also mentored them through that experience. Next slide. This is just another shot. Um, Another photo to share some of our experiences and how varied they have been. Um, our students at Maryland School for the Blind were presenting to LEGO representatives and they actually had Andreas Stefik on video call during this experience. So as we have been in this advocacy journey and also um, learning how to um, code, it's really opened up a wealth of opportunities and we're still advocating and just constantly learning. But um, the experience of having Andrea Stefik, of working with Lego and also collaborating 
with various universities and even other public school teams um, is really just invaluable. So I think the pictures speak for themselves. The kids are smiling. And again, they're going above and, and beyond in order to be there. And this would involve the dot five U dogs as well as 180 Optimum. Next slide. Just to make sure that no one is too intimidated, <laughs> this is the photo from the first time I attended EPIC. So as a reminder, that is the annual conference that um, allows people to go and learn about quorum with the quorum team. So uh, we said we were making the computer gang sign, if I remember correctly. Um, and Stefik is on the bottom left-hand corner there. So. Um, he's a really laid back, cool guy um, and enjoys hearing from people and is always up to the, the challenge of what to invent or do next. So um, please don't be intimidated by coding or anything that you've heard tonight. Reach out and get support because it's def definitely available. Next slide. Um, these are just some videos that we're not going to play, but um, they are from that Lego visit day, and they're the students talking about accessibility and why coding or STEM is important to them. It also has a, uh, a video where Stefik is speaking, and he's explaining some of the logistics of um, Quorum, and Quorum Studio was actually in development, being launched and, and refined at that time. So. Just more resources for you. Yeah, Next and slide. I think uh, Gina. Yeah, I thought we'd just uh, go to questions. I, I we'll have these uh, resources available to everyone um, later. Um, we'll share these slides, but uh, I thought we could go to questions at this point. So yeah, I I thought we would do that too. Um, yeah, there so is we'll an just, extensive amount of resources available. Right, kind of flipping through them, so. There's videos and there's direct links to all the different things that we've covered um, mm -hmm. and some things that I would call bonus information if you want to dig a little deeper. And, and just as a reminder, we have three more uh, webinars, one for teachers, for teachers who might have a deaf and hard of hearing student, one for learning disabilities and one for neurodiverse. So I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. And we're back. And, and one thing uh, uh, we would like people to do is do the evaluation. And is that link in the chat? I am going to drop it in right now. So while we're answering questions, I would please encourage you to just take a minute to fill that out. It helps us learn from what we're doing and um, figure out what's useful for you all. Yeah. So are there some questions in the chat? Um, there are some folks asked about slides, so um, I'll send an email that will uh, have a link to that tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. So look out for that. Then um, Maria asked about uh, how inclusive Python is for BVI students. Mm -hmm. Gina, any thoughts on Python? Um, so I'm really just digging deeper into Python, but I would default back to the example of Java versus Quorum. Of course, I'm biased, um, and I'll say that straight out about Quorum. So um, <laughs> there, there is value in students learning both languages. And you know, Sina knows multiple languages. Um, but there are aspects of, of using Python that are very similar to Java. It has a lot of extra. Um, What's the term, Richard? It's punctuation and spacing. Yeah. There's there's spatial challenges in there. Because of the indentation. So yes. they, they got rid of the curly braces, but they added indentation to take care of that. And so it is, you know, if you don't have your screen reader on verbose, uh, you're you're just gonna you're gonna miss the spacing altogether. So and it is I a challenge. To deviate a little bit, you know, one of the the other things that's happening with Quorum Studio um, right now is that they're, they have already launched it and they continue to expand it, but they're making graphics 
possible for it to be coded and to be fully accessible by a blind coder. So a blind coder could develop um, a game using Quorum and still access all of the information that um, you would need to be thinking about, the angle of the character and where it's moving. Um, you do not have that equal opportunity with any other programming language that I know of, and Stefik is um, you know, constantly working on that. Epic was virtual last year and it will be virtual this year in July. Um, but that would, if you're really interested in, in comparing those, I would encourage you to drop in on Epic or join that listserv. And um, I'm sure you could, you could be given not only more examples, but also examples from multiple perspectives from really experienced coders. Are there other questions? Up yeah, there? there's also some discussion in the in the chat about the extent to which a lot of these tools are tied to one platform and, or another rather than kind of being platform agnostic. And I don't, you know, I don't know if you all know of something that's platform agnostic or have any commentary on that. Well, I, I can say a little bit because uh, I worked with Lauren Milley on Blocks for All and, you know, that to just get it going on, say, iOS for the iPad, that was a huge challenge. And so converting that to do, so an Android tablet uh, would be just like, it would be 50% more work. So it's not, you know, most of these projects or most of these things are not like, people are not making tons of money on them. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's difficult to do multiple platforms. Uh, now for Blocks for All, uh, there is the issue of using the dash robot and so we are considering using you know doing the api for other robots and also i should say about something about the ipad that it is really quite accessible for blind children and so mm -hmm. it's very common to find these among uh, in schools for the blind and and so on so it is a platform that is a, of high value uh, to blind kids there's also a question in here about grid-based coding and unplugged activities and ways that you can make those accessible to um, blind students. For Gina, if you don't might, you might not know what unplugged activities are, but there's a there's a website, Computer Science Unplugged. I don't know if you've done any of those. I haven't done any of those, but I I would believe that Code and Go Mouse is an unplugged activity. You're not using a yeah or anything there so I'm, I'm familiar with the concept um, mm. and then I would also going back to Stefik's work and things um, they purposely created unplugged activities that um, are complementary in the computer science um, curricula that was developed so I have a comment about the unplugged activities many of them can be made to be uh, accessible maybe and I have invented a few of my own and I once did a, uh, a workshop with some blind kids and we did sorting algorithms. We had them sit in chairs and then they were say sorting on, on their birthdays or, some, or their height or something like that. And so if it was their height, they had to do kind of a local, they were doing like insertion sort. Uh, and so they had to do compare their heights uh, standing next to each other. And then they'd have to either, you know, stay where they are or change seats, things like that. But when they did something like on their birthdays, they could shout out their birthdays. And so they had this sort of other mechanism by which they could shout out their birthday and sort by doing broadcast. And so they could actually sort faster by broadcast. And they kind of discovered that on their own. So it's kind of a, a very rich activity. So yeah, you can make these uh, computer science unplugged. I mean, it might take some creativity, but it's, it's possible. There's another question about um, programming tools that are more reliant on music and sound than visual output, um, which is certainly with a lot of mainstream things that the visual output can be problematic for this population. What are some good tools that focus on um, music and sound? Is that question, do you think it's related to mainstream tools or specialized tools? Like the um, Code Jumper is basically audio output. The, it's tactile input, if you like, but audio output. 
Um, so Gina, do you have any thoughts? I kind of had the same question on on what they were focusing, if that oh, was- Oh, sorry. It says, do you have any suggestions for programming tools that are more reliant on music or sound rather than visual output? Well, I mean, going back to the MIDI code would be the first go-to there. Mm. Um, and there is a, a MIDI library, um, and I'm still gonna point back to that Google group. Um, there, there are a lot of people on there that have um, really intensive interest in, in MIDI. Um, one of my Epic friends, um, Co, has uh, been working on a, a project that has a jukebox approach to MIDI. Um, so again, there's there's really a lot of support there. And I'll also put in the plug that Form Studio was working on working um, was working on on focusing across different platforms. So they were focusing on iOS um, as well as Android. So it's always um, always working on improving. So it's one of my most favorite things to do is to ask Steph, like, hey, can we do this? And he really has never told me no. He just always has it, you know, on a timeline somewhere. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, Steph is always looking for new things to do with Forum and, and doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, we are getting close to time. Um, uh, somebody one, asked about one last question, I think. Okay. Um, blocks for all, it only works on iPads. Is that correct, Richard? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and there are a couple questions about sphere of drums, uh, is all audio output, but it might not be accessible. And somebody asked about or Orion graffiti. Any word about whether that is accessible? Mm. Graf Graffiti, if they're talking about what I think they are, is um, sort of think of a Braille display with multiple rows of Braille cells. So there, there were a number of products in the works that were focused on sort of instant tactile graphics. Um, at least one of them, I think, is on the market, but um, it's one of those challenges of how do you produce something like that in such a low incidence field and still have it at a, um, a marketable price that is really achievable for schools and, and clients. Um, so I'm not sure what the exact status of it is, but it's definitely not readily available. Great, Gina. And I wanna thank you for your presentation. That's fantastic. And uh, I also wanna thank the the audience today and uh, everybody that's in the audience you registered we have your email so we'll contact you to do that and also I we didn't talk about the oh we talked about the evaluation and make sure that you do that if you have the link there uh, just open it now on your computer and then you can do it before uh, you go to bed tonight I guess hopefully <laughs> anyway so and I wanted to and, and we can we can thank Gina. If you go to uh, reactions down there, uh, there's an applause on the left, and you can just put that up, and it'll pop up. Everybody's applause is coming up on the screen. So thank you so much, Gina. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you for having me and everybody that's made the journey possible. Um, I hope this was helpful to you um, out there in the audience. And please feel free to to be in touch and. I hope to see you at Epic. Great.